I saw a werewolf with a Chinese menu in his hand. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the view of Wolfpack Research or any of its officers. The views and opinions expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on this program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. We are not investment advisors. We hold no registrations with the SEC, FINRA, or any other regulatory agency, and none of the opinions expressed on this podcast should be considered investment advice. The listener should assume that we have positions in and stand to benefit from any stock or other security mentioned on this podcast. Do your own research before making investment decisions. Welcome to the Whoop Den, everybody. This is Dan David joining you again. Here we're, we have the pack with us. Uh, and by the pack, I mean Carl, our sound engineer. God help us all. Let's try and get through it. Carl, you're going to have to be on your best behavior. We have a very special guest with us today. We have Joe Nocera, award-winning writer, publisher, knows finance, knows the business world. I know that uh, Joe's going to be embarrassed that I'm going to have to read some of this stuff, but I'm reading it anyway, Joe. <laughs> he has won three Gerald Loeb Awards for Excellence in Business Journalism, a Helen Bernstein Prize for the Excellence in Journalism. He has earned three John Hancock Awards for Excellence in Business Writing and was a finalist for, wait for it, the Pulitzer Prize in 2006. That's quite a resume in and of itself, but Joe is also the author of at least four books that I could find. I think he's working on another he might talk to us about. Indentured, the inside story of the rebellion against the NCAA, which I love because it is indentured servitude. Uh, All the Devils Are Here, written with Bethany McLean, uh, the hidden story behind the financial crisis. A book that I want to talk to Joe about, Good Guys and Bad Guys, Behind the Scenes, with the saints and the scoundrels of American business and everything in between. Uh, in his first book, A Piece of the Action, How the Middle Class Joined the Money Class. And he could follow that up and how there's no middle class anymore. Okay. So, Joe, welcome to the show. That's true enough. <laughs> well, you're right about that. I would have a different title if I had to write that book again today. Yeah, yeah, that's been completely screwed up. I know your history well because I follow you, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast do, but, you know, you've got a, a, a pretty – rich history starting out as a writer from like almost day one and then going into editing for fortune and the new york times and now with bloomberg you know can you give us the uh five minute rundown don't forget the podcast yeah oh yeah my the, podcast the podcast Jeez. well look, look the podcast we're going to talk about that's <laughs> that that is a big reason for this this interview is the podcast which i binged by the way the it's the shrink next door. The shrink, the, the shrink next door. Yes, soon, soon to be an Apple TV series. Oh, it's a series, not a movie. Oh, it's going to be an eight-part Apple TV series starring Will Ferrell, Paul Rudd, and Catherine Ha. The A-list. Well, which one? Which one's playing you? I heard Brad Pitt was playing you, or somebody like that. <laughs> nah, they cut the journalist out of the story. Damn it. They cut the, the anyway. The story doesn't happen without the journalist. You, you were the guy who broke the story because you lived next door to this psychopath. That's exactly right. Oh. That's exactly what happened. All right. Well, anyway. I, I want to talk about the shrink next door because I, I you know. my 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 history is um, after after being a political reporter for a little while in D.C., then moving to France for a couple of years because my wife, my first wife, I should say. Um, Became, was a diplomat, and then I moved to Texas to go to work for uh, Texas Monthly. And um, yeah, but what, well, I mean, look, your wife was a diplomat in France. Come on, we we got to hear a little bit about that. Was that cool? Did the French treat you guys as bad as everybody else? <laughs> I mean, she was a diplomat, so it was a long, long time ago. And uh, we drove around in a crap on and that shock absorbed, so it just bounced up and down like crazy. But it had diplomatic plates. And then the cops would always pull us over because they couldn't believe that a diplomat would be riding such a shitty car. <laughs> and then she would show them, she would show them her diplomatic passport, and they would shrug their shoulders, and off we would go. This was 1981. No, excuse me, 19. Yeah, in 1981, there was a, there was at least one instance when a terrorist tried to bomb one of the diplomats at the U.S. Embassy with wow. a car bomb. And you were there for that. I was there for that. It was a scary. There was a. There was a scary time. It was a scary time. Well, I mean, to your point, though, they would never think to choose your car. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, we were safe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, 
you matriculated from France to Texas as one does. It seems like they're they're yeah, basically as one does. Yeah. So and um and this is kind of where things got interesting. Um the editor who hired me, Nick Lemon, even while I was in France, gave me my first assignment. He said, when you get here, I want you to write about this guy, this oil man named T. Boone Pickens. Yeah. And the reason we're interested in him, the reason we're interested in him is because he doesn't act like a Texas oil man. He, like, he doesn't hate Wall Street. You know, he, he has a stock price. Uh, he doesn't sneer at Yankees. You know, um, he's doing something interesting. So go up and meet him. So I went up to his house and uh, he served me blackened catfish. Cool. And uh, what he called at the time, fully fussy. What? Fully fussy? Fully fussy. Fully fussy. <laughs> Hell, you say it while well, you had your French accent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and so I started in on this profile. And um, there were all these times when I'd be with them and a phone call would come and he'd, they'd shoot me out of the room. I would be on a flight and he'd have all these. Uh, and I started to hear rumors that he was going to do a, a, a takeover, which don't forget, in 1982, that was not normal. Uh -huh. That was still right. um, kind of out there as a, as, a, as a practice. And uh, so I said to him once, because I didn't know anything about business, so I just said to him, Boone, um, Boone are you going are you going to do a takeover? Because I need to know that for my story. And he said, Joe, you know, I could tell you that, but if I did, I'd be violating the law. <laughs> Oops. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I was in Houston uh, interviewing uh, his son, and in the middle of the interview, it comes over the wire that um, – not that Mesa, Boone's company, is going to go after City Service, but City Service has made a, a, a play for Mesa. Right. So they flipped it around. Yeah. And uh, so I called Boone and I said, what the hell's going on? And he said, Joe, why are you in Houston? The play's in New York. Right. So I went to New York, I went to New York and I spent the next three weeks in the Waldorf Astoria going into his room every morning until the lawyers or somebody kicked me out. And then uh, I'd meet up with them at night, usually at the 21 Club. Then they would fill me in on what had happened. And uh, this went on for like three weeks. And I wrote a story. I wrote what I, what I believe to this day is the only story about a takeover written from inside the takeover. Yeah, it was like a war room they had in there, right? Yeah, it, 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 totally, totally. It was like a war room. And, um, uh, you know, in the end, Boone didn't take city service, but city service didn't take over Boone. It got very exciting at the end because golf came in and Bruce Wasserstein was trying to persuade golf to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to take, to take city and Mesa and Boone had to, you know, threaten to go to Congress or whatever to block it. And <laughs> so it, it was pretty exciting. So that was my very first business story, and that's sort of how I got in that I got room. On business. Was there ever a moment in that room where you're like, "I cannot, I, I cannot even freaking believe I'm here right now"? And see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I had never written a business story before. Yeah. I did not know at the time what an extraordinary gift I'd been handed. Right. I didn't really oh, realize that till a couple of years later. I mean, I knew it was a great story, but I didn't realize that it was unprecedented. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely unprecedented. And and, and uh, Boone's lawyer was Joe Flom, you know, uh, who, was, who was one of the most famous merger lawyers. And he hated the fact that I was there because if the other side had found out, they would have lost their attorney-client privilege. Yeah, why, why did Boone – I mean, look, first of all, why did he choose to have a reporter in the room – during this sensitive time where attorney client privilege could have been very, very important, right? If, especially if he's going to court o over this, which he could have. And then right. with somebody who, as you kind of put it, really has no idea what they're doing when it comes to writing a business story of this sort, or this is your kind of fledgling attempt at it. Right. Well, um, I had been working on this story for two months before the deal broke. Uh -huh. So we had gotten to know each other and he had concluded that I was, even though I was a liberal from the East, I was okay. <laughs> oh. I was a good guy. Uh, okay. And, 
And, and so that's part of it. But the other part of it was, you know, Boone had been pro. He he was not a big name at that point. Yeah. Um, he this was his first major deal. Right. And he wanted to catapult from the business pages to um, a higher profile uh, platform. And Texas Monthly was and is, I might add, a great magazine that was revered in the state of Texas um, and had a fair amount of influence outside of it. So it was a kind of a good natural step between that and the cover of Time magazine, which he got two years later when he tried to take over Gulf. Yeah. And then and then the name drop in Wall Street. Right. That was that was kind of the first time I ever heard his name is when uh, when was it James Spader kind of dropped his name in Wall Street talking to uh, Bud Fox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Well, right. So, so you went you you went from like hobnobbing with Boone, drinking I don't know pussyfoot or whatever it's called or parfaits. Pui fusé, baby. Pui fusé. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. If you say so. Uh, you know what, Carl? That's your new nickname. Pui fusé. <laughs> I like it. Pui fusé. So you went from there, and you uh, you, you landed at back in New York uh, to your liberal roots, as Boone would say. No, I didn't. I didn't go back to New York. I went to um, I went to Northampton, Massachusetts. Same thing. Um, because uh, a friend of mine from Texas Monthly, Dan Okren, had moved to uh, Massachusetts to start a magazine called New England Monthly, and I wanted to get back to the East Coast. I had a kid by then. Uh -huh grandparents were all on the east coast so we moved back to the east coast spent the next two decades in northampton um though not at that magazine for that long and and just became you know freelancer then a columnist with gq a columnist with esquire right i wrote my first book a piece of the action and then landed after a piece of the action came out landed on the staff of fortune magazine and which i did via commuting for about 10 10 years from Massachusetts. Yeah. I would go in on Tuesdays and come home on Friday nights. Well, that's a hell of a and, commute. Um, it was not, it was not a lot of fun. Um, I, although, you know, I had a place here and, 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 and then, you know, the worst, I was actually in the train on a Tuesday morning when nine 11 took place oh, and uh, we all saw the towers go down from our, our window. And we were right about to go into Penn, Penn station. Well, yeah, I mean, that's one of those things everybody knows where they were. I was on my way to the airport, yeah. Phil Philadelphia airport. So, but yeah, things got turned around that day. What a, what a crazy time. Yeah. And so you, you were in the city and then you probably couldn't get out. Well, no, what happened was we were outside the city. There were 15 trains behind us. Uh -huh. We sat in the train for four hours. We thought we were going to be turned around and sent back, but there were so many trains behind us. They decided that our train would go into Penn station. It was so lucky. And they took everybody off the train. The train was supposed to go to Virginia. I, I remember these old ladies getting hustled off the train by the by the National Guard. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, I am so happy. I'm going to walk to the office now and be productive and try and do something good. I know you're not. And uh, these old ladies were like, "What the hell? How the hell are we going to get to Virginia?" You're not anytime soon. I I, I worked in New York at that point. My my office was on uh, 38th and 5th. Uh, but I didn't have to go into New York that day. And it turns out I couldn't get back in for like a week. And the people who yeah, did work right. in, were in the office that day spent the night in Bryant Park you know, with all kinds of crap going on and people trying to sell water for 20 bucks a bottle. And it was just disgusting. Right. But, wow, that's that's interesting. And you, when you were at uh, Fortune, you, you became an editor. And you actually gave, uh, according to Herb Greenberg, you gave him his start. And you even edited his Tycho piece. Oh, I did a few things like that. Yeah. Uh, no, I was a writer and an editor. Um, I wrote some stories uh, during the internet craziness of the late seventies. Um, and then I was an editor for more, mostly for the last five years. And yeah, I edited Herb. That was fun. Sort of. So there was, <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh. let's unpack this for a second. So there, there was an internet craze in the late seventies. Well, the late nineties, I said. Oh, late seventies. Oh, okay. oh, right. I, I, I just, 90s. I just might have missed it. I, you know, I. Yeah. So the late nineties, and you, and you edited Herb. Do you remember anything about the Tycho story and uh, and going through that? Because that's kind of the last time I remember somebody really going to jail. 
Dennis Kozlowski? Yeah. Did he go after um, Schilling and uh, Skilling yes. and, uh, and and Ken Lang? Yes. Yes, he did. Yeah, it was like three, four yeah, years yes, after. He did. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out like you can't just outfit many of your homes with company money, although I, I think that's a growth industry now. <laughs> Although, you know, today he would never go to jail for something like that. I, I, he'd I agree. A, he'd, he'd get a tiny little slap on the wrist. I agree. I mean, when you look back, okay, Skilling got 14 years. Skilling, Skilling actually got 26 years, reduced to 14 yeah. after a Supreme Court decision. Kenley died, of course. Yeah, he got lucky. A lot of those other Enron people went to jail for a year or two. Um, you know, and compare that to sentences today. What sentences? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think about, I think about the General Motors the thing where they where they um uh where they had that ignition problem yeah do you remember this yeah yeah and, yeah yeah dateline, and, dateline and, and, did a recreation and, of it and, and 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 they sparked something underneath it so they got sued right and and somebody consciously consciously changed that ignition yeah i can't remember why but but there was a reason they they didn't want they knew it was wrong and they didn't fix it and people died and people died, and that person was never indicted. Really? In fact, if you read the indictment of GM or the charges against GM, mm -hmm. it's all in the passive voice. No, it's, it's as if there's no human beings working at General Motors. It's just the company did this, the company did that. No, people did this. Well, I, look, look, I mean, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I've often said that companies cannot commit fraud. It is impossible for a company to commit fraud. They're bricks and mortar, they're a name, they're, you know, they're they're carpeting in the hallways. People at companies commit fraud. But right. then companies pay this big fine to the SEC or to who whatever agency, probably bigger than their budget for the year. And what they're really saying to any one of these agencies is, here's two hundred and fifty million dollars. We'll give it to you but we'll spend $500 million to defend anybody you want to put in jail. What do you want to do? How do you want to play this? You want to take the free money or not? Yeah, that's, I always thought Preet was uh, insanely overrated on this front because mm -hmm. I felt like he, he would always say, well, you can't put someone in jail if, you can't, if, if no crime has been committed. <laughs> and, and you could say to him, well, well Preet, you know, crime is in the eye of the beholder i mean it's your job if something really bad happens to, to to decide whether there's a crime or not in the gm case again that sticks in my craw yeah the idea that, that, that no crime was committed is is beyond belief i would say before we before uh, we move on it'll be interesting to see what happens with elizabeth holmes yeah and theranos we've been talking about that so she's one right so she's one person who is uh going to go to trial uh -huh. and uh, I, I think the chances of her being found guilty is are high and uh -huh. then we'll see what kind of sentence she gets well i imagine she's trying to work out something for you know maybe a couple years or whatever it, it was interesting i was talking with soren andal and and carson yesterday for one of their programs and soren teaches kind of the the jim chanos class but at, at university of texas fraud and folly and I, I joined him for that class as a, as a, as a guest speaker, and I, I jumped in as he was asking the class the question as part of their homework, a survey, will Elizabeth Holmes go to jail? Uh, mm -hmm. And if she does, how many years will she get? One to three, three to five, over five years. Not one student in the entire class thought that she would go to jail for one day. Wow. Wow. That's... But almost every one of them thought she committed a crime. So that's the cynicism right. that we have yeah. in an MBA class at, at really a great financial university. I mean, I, UT has been turning out some some real smart kids, but they're just like, hey, you know, nobody goes to jail anymore, and I can't blame them. Could you? No, no, no. That was a that's a realistic appraisal. What do you think of the Elizabeth Holmes? I mean, how much do you think she'll get? I mean, what's your prediction here? Do you think she'll get time? I think she'll go to Well, you know, you know, they had to delay the trial because she's having a baby. Yeah, so, uh, that, was, that was smart. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, exactly. So she's got that now to fall back on. Um, I think she'll get one to three. Yeah, that's what I said. I was, I, I was, I, I was of the one three mode.
Soren was the only one in there that thought she would get up to 10 years. I'm just like, there's just no effing way. But who knows? No. Maybe. Maybe. So you went from Fortune, and, and oh, well, we're talking about, you know, CEOs that have gone to jail. We should mention that the Mimetic CEO, Parker Petit, went to jail. Well earned on his part, uh, along with another individual there. Um, the number two, the, the Taylor, the president. Yeah. Yeah, you wrote about that. Do you have anything to add to that or, you know, you know, anywhere you want to go with that? Yeah, I, I do. Mean... <laughs> I do have some things to add to that. I, 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 I'm under the impression you've discussed this before on your podcast. Uh, I actually haven't really discussed my medics before on my podcast, and I haven't really. I mean, I, I know this leads to Mark Cahotis to some degree because there was he, he, f he was featured prominently in your article. And I, and I generally don't have anything to say about him one way or another because I just don't give a shit. Uh, but he seems to. So, you know, let's have it. Well, you know, my Manix is it's certainly not the kind of company I usually write about. But um, I got interested in it because um, somebody, had taken, somebody had taken a long position, the prescient point uh -huh. down in Louisiana. Uh -huh. And they had bought think seven percent of the stock and they were saying this company there's definitely a problem inside this company but you know it's 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 a limited problem and um there's nothing fundamentally wrong with their product and um uh they should be okay once once the the ceo and the the president are ousted which which of course did happen mark who had been ahead of the curve and saying that this um, CEO Parker Petit was was a crook. Mm -hmm. um, it was channel stuffing, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, so the stock went from eighteen to one. Yeah. So you know, he won. He won. He was yeah. right. He won. Yeah. And at the point where the stock was won, Petit was gone. Taylor was gone. New management. New board. A lot of the uh, executives were ousted. And yet Mark couldn't stop going after them. And he wouldn't, he would just continue to say they're, they're, they're bad. They're corrupt. They're it's criminal. An ongoing criminal enterprise. Ongoing criminal enterprise. Yeah. He actually used that phrase in a tweet. And I, I, I just decided to dive in and see what was going on. It just was it went, it went one of these kind of fights that I, I kind of get interested in. Yeah. So I sort of looked into it. And the more I looked into it, the more I came to the conclusion that while he deserved a pat on the back and presumably some money for his short, assuming he sold short, um, you know, that there was something I didn't understand why he wasn't just moving on to something else. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I wrote two columns that basically said that, that basically said, you know, it's bad when you, when you, when you make up stuff on the long side, that's bad. But when you make up stuff on the short side, that's bad too. Turns out, yeah. And you know, the stock now is up to about ten. Yeah. But it's a, it, you know, the, the management's not as strong as you, it, you one might like, and and they're waiting for the FDA to approve this product uh, that's been in the pipeline forever. But the thing that struck me, it, it's weird that you're bringing this up because I just happened to uh, go on the Bloomberg terminal the other day, and and sort of fish around my medics and see what was going on. And, you know, they, they're being sued by their lawyers mm -hmm. for not paying, I think they're $40 million in debt to their lawyers. Wow. And they're, 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 they're defending themselves against, um, uh, you know, securities lawsuits, you know, strikes, yeah. strike suits, uh, which is going to cost them. Uh, it cost them seventy million dollars to, you know, investigate um, uh, the Parker Petit thing, and to, you know, sort of they they lost an auditor along the way because the auditor was scared off by Mark. Um, and and the upshot is, the CEO and the president did something bad for which they should go to prison. Right. But the burden that this company is paying, the price that it is paying, ongoing price it is paying, 
for for Marx continued assault, although it's dropped off recently, and 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 the and the the sort of indebtedness and the you know there's not a big company they don't have a lot of cash. Um, I I find to be appalling, and the thing that bothers me the most about it is that this is a company that makes devices isn't the right word. Uh, patches yeah for burn victims that yeah. help burn burn victims or people with diabetes um or um you know eventually with the product that hasn't come out yet um it can help you know with with your joints with sho- with sore shoulders and really bad knees and so on and so forth god i could use that you want this stuff to be available you, you want this company to be able to, to to offer these products to doctors and to patients and yet they're they're you get the sense that they're just struggling just to keep their head above water. Well, I mean, I, th- I think they obviously are. And uh, look, I'm in the unenviable position of, you know, maybe sounding like I'm going to defend Mark here. Oh, but <laughs> I don't know that his ongoing attack ad hominem kind of your uh, ongoing criminal enterprise with no details of exactly who the criminals are in the organization any longer, you know, are are the reason are, are the heavy price they're paying. I mean, look, they've chosen a law firm that you said, what they, they owe 40 million and they had already paid 70 million. If you ask my opinion, if you're going to charge 70 or 110 million for investigations into a company, you're the ongoing criminal enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you the management may be a little weak. Yeah. Uh, you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, look, I mean, I don't think that 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 part of it is on Mark and fine. He was he was definitely he was right to begin with. But, yeah, if there is a good product there, you know, whether they make it or not, I hope I hope somebody makes that if if it is a good product. I've not studied it. Mark's uh, ongoing assault has definitely put a cloud over the company. Mm-hmm. So even if you say, yeah, they shouldn't have spent all that money, it, it does mean that doctors and you know, uh, hospitals um, are sh- would, would shy away from it because they hear that, you know, oh, my God, you know, bad things, bad things. Mm. And I think they've had a hard time overcoming that. Yeah. Well, again, yeah, I, I, I think you're 100 percent right. That's that's very bad management. Uh, if you've got a product that works and you can't overcome a doctor's concerns about the efficacy, then then you know what? Time for new management again. But yeah, that was a it, it was a very interesting saga. It continues, and it's it's funny because you know, like you're now Joe no Sarah er er ha ha ha. <laughs> yeah, that's what I am. Uh, oh, also the other thing is he uh, he puts a hat on me, a uh, picture of me, and yeah. says I'm a, a ass hat. Is I don't even I never heard ass hat before. Oh, I use it all the time. I, guess, I love ass hat. <laughs> uh, okay, you love ass hat. Okay, I'm learning something. <laughs> I'm learning something every day. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, it's it's I don't know, a different kind of nomenclature for dumbass or what 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 whatever. You don't whatever. care. Whatever. I mean, like, gee, uh Apple just picks up your podcast for a series with Will Farrell and 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 others. I, I think you're I, I don't think it's affected you the way it affected uh my medics. You seem to be doing fine. Well, yeah, I mean who cares? I mean, yes, I have a reputation. Mark can try to destroy that reputation, but he's not going to succeed. And at a certain point, um, uh, Bloomberg just told me to stop responding to him and and shut up and just, you know, and I and I did. And it was a smart thing to do. Every once in a while, I would just get so mad I'd, I'd respond. And that was always a mistake. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm fine. It is the other thing is I I, I was. Once I wrote those stories, it was like I was more or less done with this whole thing, and I was yeah. moving on. Right. And he spent the next year saying that I was a, you know, tool of, of Zach Cowie's and yada yada yada. Right. Um, and 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 being paid, which I I do find I am offended that a bunch of these people said you know I was being paid by my medics or being paid by Zach or That's whatever. That's stupid. That's just stupid, and, and, and not, not the least of which, you know, if, if Zach's spending the money on you, maybe that's why he has a two-bedroom apartment in Brooklyn. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he 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 hides his wealth well. 
as yeah. as a puppet master, a Sith Lord, like, uh, like or Patrick whatever. Burn, yeah. it, it, it is it is a very kind of interesting thing. And this backs up to your book of good guys, bad guys behind the scenes, and and I and I had read, of course, the Patrick Byrne saga in there, and and really there you talk about David Rocker, which which was Mark's partner. I don't think you mentioned Mark at all. But no, I don't. How how Patrick Byrne was like, there's this cabal, there's this Sith Lord, there's this whatever, and he's just bullying and pushing everybody around through this whole thing. And you know what? I'm just going to say it. I feel like that's what Mark's doing now. He's just bullying people, Patrick Byrne style. Um, yeah, I would say that. And it, I mean, it works in the sense that people are scared and they don't want to write about them because um, there's no upside. Mm -hmm. Man, that's what Byrne did. I mean, he really scared. I mean, everybody. He was he was crazy. He was totally crazy. Are we still talking and, about Patrick, or we're we still on Mark? <laughs> no, 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 we're on Patrick now. Oh, okay, because you know he, Patrick was crazy, right. and th th there were a lot. I mean, there were a lot of stories written about him, and then one by one, we all sort of decided to move on because it wasn't worth the trouble. Yeah, and um, and and we did, and uh, and then. You know, that scorched earth uh, mentality can work when people have a life they've got to get back to. Right. I mean, there's only so much time you can dedicate to nonsense that is not accretive to your business or, you know, is just, you know, dragging you down to a, a dark mental state. You know, I, I've often said with some of these guys on Twitter when you're responding to them, and this goes for any of these, you know, trolls or tumors, a, as you continue to do that. Their ignorance, they bring you down to their level and beat you with experience of being just an ignorant toad. <laughs> That's about right. Yeah. That's about right. Well, that was a, it was a, it was an interesting book in there. Like I think a lot of people with good guys and bad guys were like, Oh, you know, you're pro short seller. And I mean, I, I guess you kind of are. You're just pro truth, right? And you don't care if it's sh on the short side or long side, you're agnostic to that part of it. Is that true? Um, I, I have generally been in my career pro short seller because short sellers have needed to be defended mm -hmm. over time. Um, you know, buyers on the long side, people on the long side, they don't need, they don't need to be defended. They're, 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 you know, doing the Lord's work. Sure. As people would think of it, <laughs> but, but the short side is always getting, whenever there's a problem, the short side's being attacked, you know, we got to set down the shorts. The shorts are, are, are the reason our stock is down. Yada, 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 yada. So I would say I have been pro short because the shorts have needed journalists to defend them. Right, right, and that, and you think that's changed a bit today? I I, I do think the um, short and distort, as they call it, um, does exist, really? especially on social media. I I, I absolutely do, and um, you know I think it's terrible. Yeah, I mean one of the things I admired about the shorts was. They dug deep and they got the best information. Uh -huh. And, you know, you, you had to, to do what they did. And, and when they came out with a report, uh, the company might object to it, but it was usually impregnable in many cases. And, and you know, when you see this stuff on Twitter, it's not really like that. Yeah, I mean, you're actually talking about the Rocker Partner days with with Cahotis and David Rocker. Like they, they had a really thought through short thesis in the early 2000s, and and they they could defend and did have to defend it, right? I mean, there's uh, right. Fairfield Financial and right. and uh, w with some of the other shorts, and there's and there's Overstock, which was a massive defense, and then you had the. Uh, uh, the brothers down in Florida, right? I Feshback. Mean, Feshback brothers. The Feshbacks, they yeah. were like the originals. They they were. They're the OGs of the OGs, right? They <laughs> they were they were doing and, and and Kurt is just a really fun guy to talk to on, on the interview we did. But I mean I guess I could sign up for the fact that when you're when you're putting out a short thesis and what is it, two hundred and forty characters or less nowadays yeah. uh, for Twitter and yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, like, I I don't know how that can be as, as well thought out. And for our part, what we're dealing with as well is just the the tiny, tiny attention span of the viewer, the reader, uh, the end user that doesn't want to read 
not even the bullets anymore or the conclusion, right? So you're, we're doing video or we're doing something to grab people's attention because nobody wants to do the work of actually reading the work that somebody else did. Can't disagree. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you're not going to disagree, we're just going to we're just going to move on then. Damn it. <laughs> good. Good call. Good call. <laughs> so you you wrote a book I was pretty interested in. All the devils are here, and you wrote it with Bethy McLean. Is she as is she as lovely as she seems to be, and bright and witty and all that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and smart as hell. Yeah. She's got something that I lack, which is rigor. Mm. What is that? She really. Yeah. She knows how to dissect data. As I like to say, she knows how to find stories in balance sheets, which is uh, not a skill that I have. Right. Uh, it's some pretty boring shit when you have to, like, try and explain it to people and keep their attention. So, you know, if she's got that talent, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to talk to her at one of these points, and I, I want to know more about Enron and how, how, how seriously she was taken to begin with. But I thought The Devils Are All Here was, you know, you know a, a great book for people to pick up about the financial crisis. And you're writing your next book. What is that? It's about, uh, it's also with Bethany, and it's about COVID and the economy. Oh. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I would have liked to have had that book about a year and a half ago. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I would have helped, huh? Would have helped. <laughs> uh, I mean, as a short seller, it definitely would have helped. I, you know, I conceptually just misjudged the amount of liquidity that $7 trillion will, will cause in the market and that all things, frauds included, will go up. GSX being one of them and, you know, many others. Uh, yep. it, it, they, you know, it's the passive investments. I don't know if you guys are talking about this. I'm sure you'd have to, but like, you know, how, how do they invest? They're agnostic to the investing part of it. Money comes in, they invest it, they spread it out there. Money goes out irrespective of price they're investing right they don't care and then money goes out irrespective of price they're selling and it goes out and you look at things like gamestop and and the rest where insider holders and passive investment made up like over 80 percent of the float which causes the squeeze yeah i can't i that's I, i'm very interested in passive investing uh and what's happened the theories around passive investing, because I was a big um, uh, supporter and fan of uh, Jack Bogle, uh -huh. and 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 somehow passive investing has um, become so big, yeah, that it almost overwhelms the marketplace, except for stocks like GameStop and so on. And you know, a lot of people who think it creates. I, I don't quite understand even that, that, it, that companies don't need to compete against each other because they're all owned by Vanguard and, and, right. and BlackRock. Right. So and on how, and so forth. And, and how do they make money if there's zero fees, right? So they're making money on the borrow. Right. Uh, they're lending out shares, and that's how they're making money. They're not doing it for free. It might be free to you, but it's not, it's not free to everybody in the end. But, the, you know, it's like a vine. It's like a invasive vine that just takes over your house, right? And, you you know, then you can't dig it out of the ground. I don't I don't know where we're going to be with this on a massive pullback when, when liquidity starts to come out of the market. What happens to an ARK Invest or some of these others where they just, they just have to sell? Uh, it's going to be the next well, reason ARC, for government intervention. I mean, I just sort of can't believe the... the Okay, this is a this is the problem of being my age, right? When I think of Ark, I think of Bill Miller. You know, I think of all these guys who were great until they weren't. Uh huh. Well, yeah. And I, it, just, it just sort of feels like she's Kathy's going to wind up in the same place. Rich, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Right until she's right until she's not right, and 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 still ridiculously wealthy when when she's not. So. Yes. What, are you, what are you going to say? You're going to tell everybody else, you know, it's a buyer beware market and um, they can invest or pull out whenever they want. But, you know, they are, they already know it's a buyer beware market and they don't care. Nobody cares. Nobody, Nobody cares. cares. You're right. You're right. Nobody cares. So. Can you give us any tidbits about your next book? Can you give us like a preview of something we're going to sure. see in there? It's going to be exciting. Yeah. Um, I don't know how exciting. Well, yeah. So I've spent a lot of time digging around the um, 
PPE black market. Yeah. Whoa. And 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 the way the supply chain um, for for hospital um, stuff just collapsed and was basically taken over by hedge funds, the royal family of Thailand, um, you know, cool. uh, and all sorts of uh, strange and unusual characters. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be interesting part of the book. The royal family of Thailand is involved in the PP black market here in the United States? Well, 80% of the nitro gloves sold in the world are made in, in oh no, they're made in Malaysia. Uh -huh. And uh, Thailand is deep into uh, masks, nitro gloves, um, and um, a few other things. Wow. So uh, this is a rumor. I haven't exactly asked the king and queen yet. <laughs> yeah, no. You're getting to that though, right? Oh, of course. Yes. I can't wait. It's on my list. It's on my list. I cannot wait to see the king and queen of Thailand go after you on Twitter. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> oh man, <it's, laughs> they are such trolls. They are they are notorious trolls. That's just going to be fan. I mean, you so not anyway, been trolled. Um, we're going to do a lot uh, with uh, private private equity, the involvement of private equity in nursing homes and hospitals. Oh. Bethany's going to do a lot on the Fed. So we've got you know it's going to be good. Private equity, man, uh, the nursing homes and hospitals. I mean, that's a multifaceted, that's a mostly multifaceted problem when you're talking about it in the context of the economy during COVID and, yep. and, and a sad one to investigate. I'll be interested to read about that. And we're going to look at three. Um, we're going to look at New York. We're going to look at Florida. And we're going to look at California. Oh, really? Are you going to talk to the Comos? The love gov. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, look that that's a nursing home story, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I it's, it's touchy, it. I'm sure, but like you know, that's that's part of the the story in nursing homes. I mean, if so many people would not have died in the nursing homes, then it, you know, I'd still have a stigma, but it probably wouldn't be as bad, right? Yeah, yeah. The nursing home thing is, I mean, you know, it's something like forty percent of all the COVID deaths took place in nursing homes. Right. Right. And when you require people to just accept people, whether they have COVID or not in these nursing homes, whatever States did that, that's right. You know, I mean, that's a problem that caused deaths. And there's another thing that, you know, people aren't being held accountable for pretty much anywhere that I, I think might get sussed out in the next few years, but maybe not in the next year or two. Well, I mean, <laughs> Once once COVID finally does end, we do need some sort of national appraisal. Yeah, a postmortem, yeah. so to speak, for lack of a better. Yeah, yeah, um, and we need to rethink a lot of things about uh, how we uh, how we make our economy more resilient. Yeah, well, supply chain would be a big a big you know start. Huge, yeah. right? Yeah. So that the yeah cool. Uh, now for the next, you know, few minutes that I still have you, because I know you're a very busy man writing a book. You are a, a self-described um, liberal New Yorker, but you don't have necessarily every view in the world of a liberal New Yorker, like your support for the fracking and the Keystone XL. I, I, I'm fairly agnostic there myself, but I just found it interesting that that probably might get you to invited to one or two less parties. <laughs> well, actually it got me uh, accosted in the grocery store once. Wow. Oh, wow. God, I've always wanted to be accosted in the grocery store. On the, on the upper West, on the upper West side. Um, I'm, I, I am left of center, but I'm really more a pragmatist than anything else. Uh, I, I, I want to do stuff that works. So, you know, back then, yeah, I was pro fracking and because I think energy the closer we can come to energy independence, the better off we are. The less we have to worry about Saudi Arabia and and, and yeah. Iran. It's supply and, um, chain too, isn't it? <laughs> and 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 on the on the Keystone pipeline, it's like people they don't think straight. I mean, if, if the if the oil if the if the if the Canadian oil doesn't come in through a state of the art modern pipeline, they're going to bring it in by train. 
Yeah, which is much and, more dangerous. Or truck. Cranes are much more dangerous. Many more spills. So it's just it's like common sense says, uh, you know, build a damn pipeline. So that's you know now currently you know my big thing is um, I think uh, the liberals in, in places like New York and Detroit and San Francisco have been uh, criminally negligent and not keeping the schools open. Oh. Yeah, oh, it's, sure. it's been a definitely going to get your ass kicked at a grocery store for that one, pal. <laughs> Somebody's you better um, put your arm no, around, as, Joe. As the year as the as the year has gone on, more and more people have come around to this view. Yeah, but you know the teachers' unions have been the teachers' unions have been, you know, terrible on this. Well, I mean, just shameful. They're very, very, very powerful as far as unions go. I think they're more powerful than UAW and in a lot of ways and. It's interesting. There's this documentary called Waiting for Superman. I don't know if you've ever seen yes, that. Yes, I remember. Remember it was quite a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. You can barely find it anywhere. To, and it's a wonderful documentary. And I'm not some documentary wonk, but, you know, my wife kind of made me watch it. It just showed like when you have tenure or when you have enough time in, you just can't be fired. I mean, it just is yeah. an act of Congress to get rid of, of a teacher in that case. They don't want to be reviewed on performance. That's out the window. Like, you know, the rest of us who, who make 12 bucks an hour or 15 bucks or whatever it is, we get a performance review every year. And, and if it doesn't work out, you're gone. But in, in an industry where we deride as, as something we're failing in overall, sliding down the scale and ranking in math and 24 and reading and, and science in the mid 20s versus number one 20 or 30 years ago. We're doing nothing differently. And we spend the most. Well, think, of, oh, yeah. think about how many kids, think about how many kids are, are never going to recover from the year that they were not in school. They ran. That, that they, didn't, they didn't do remote learning or they uh -huh. couldn't do remote learning or they dropped out or whatever. It's, it's the disservice. And then, you know, the increase in in in, in uh, abuse cases and suicides and depression, yeah. and and study after study after study shows that schools are the safest place during the pandemic for a kid to be. Yeah, in, in Pennsylvania, they ran out of youth mental health beds for a time. I mean, I'm not surprised. Yeah. I'm not surprised. And it, it, it was just kind of a non-story that, that that they weren't really talking about it. It did, it does have an effect. And now, and now the going back is going to have an effect, right? There's that, there's that part of it for people who don't want to go back and don't see why they have to now. They've done it differently. It's just a whole freaking mess. And I mean, yeah, listen. We've got to get it right because, you know, they're running the world someday. We've not done such a great job. So I'm kind of pinning our hopes on them. But I think, you know, I agree with you there. So far, you're, you're not a very good liberal, in my opinion. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> you know, one of the things, uh, Joe, I found really interesting, kind of twofold, was um, your, your kind of your exit uh, article where you, you kind of called out Bloomberg on his gun control policy. And I found it really interesting about the making the, you know, like the fingerprint or biometric type guns, they can do it, but they're, they're almost choosing. Right. And that you kind of challenged Mike to say, well, rather than spending millions, billions on saying restrict them all, make it more sensible where, where you can't just straw purchase or anything like that. When you went to work for Bloomberg, did, did, was there any like weird uncomfortableness in the office that, that you no, that that's, kind of a, nah. that's a cool question. Did, no. did Mike bring you in and say, listen, fucker? <laughs> no, no, he didn't. And uh, no, in that column, all I really said was, I wish Mike Bloomberg would buy a gun company uh -huh. and, and then use it to make biometric guns that could only be used by the owner because no one else who has the nerve to do that. And no one in the gun business because the NRA, they become... Um, uh, they, they, uh, there's a boycott. The minute they do, anybody tries to do that, the, the guns are boycotted. But uh, Mike, you know, I am uh, very much in favor of vaping. I'm very pro vaping, um, and Mike is is one of the strongest uh, advocates for 
uh, eliminating vaping. Why, why, so, uh, why, why are you pro? I've never met anybody over 18 that's a pro vaper. Like, you know, I mean, as a, <laughs> it sounds like you're wearing a t-shirt or something. <laughs> no, it's just, uh, uh, you could save millions of lives if everybody who smoked vaped instead. Really? No, I didn't know that. The cigarette, nicotine doesn't kill. Nicotine addicts, but it's the combusted tobacco that kills you. Uh-huh. So if you vape instead of smoke, you will you you will extend your life. Huh. So I mean, I can't believe you didn't know that. This is what the whole point of the exercise is. So you Why know, would I know that? I chew tobacco. I don't smoke it like the pussies. <laughs> public 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 policy public policy should be: we want to discourage kids from becoming addicted to nicotine, yeah. but we want to encourage adults who smoke from switching to vaping. That's what the public policy should be. Well, it's uh, controversial, Joe, I would say. Uh, I don't think that that is a pervasive argument that's out there or, or being made very well. So maybe that's your 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 book after this next one. Right now, <laughs> vaping is just getting absolutely destroyed. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a, and it's a, and it's um it's a true shame. I wrote an article about uh, Philip Morris a number of years ago before, before vaping existed. And, you know, the, I went down to, I went down to Richmond and um, went to their factory and went to their, uh, um, you know, met their scientists and they all kept talking about how they were trying to work on what they call the harm reduction cigarette. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I couldn't envision what such a thing would look like. I, I couldn't envision how you could have a cigarette that reduced the, 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 the lethality uh, uh, of the device, of cigarettes. Uh-huh. And then all of a sudden, along came this thing called vaping, which gave you the nicotine hit, which is what you want, but it didn't give you the tobacco. Well, and it's like, oh, oh, this is it. This can do it. But then kids went crazy for it with Juul. Yeah. And um, that was not a good thing. Yeah. President Obama wasn't having it. He doesn't like uh, flavored cigarettes either. Can we do do it just like when we were kids? We stick some pot in an apple and smoke it? I mean, just. Uh, I, I, I don't know everybody that did that, Carl. And <laughs> we don't really want to hear about your sick child life. <laughs> So, all right. So past vaping, you know, you, you, you are political. You consider the Tea Party Republicans terrorists. No, Fair? no. Uh, I, apologize. I apologize for that. Oh, did you? Well, some of, some, yeah. of, some of them kind of were. I mean, like, you know, I mean, some of them. Uh, be, oh, believe me, I ran into many of them. And it, 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 that wasn't as far off as you might think. What do you think of the far, far left now that is, you know, kind of taking – uh, the Democratic Party further left, like you know, you get you get a classroom full of tenth graders write a letter to the president and policy changes. What? <laughs> I mean, something like that. <laughs> I, I, I uh, you know, I think Biden. I think Biden is about as far left as I want to go. Yeah, yeah, I think he's about as far left as he wants to go too. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's his, about right. Yeah, and that's his problem. Okay, so I, I, I guess it's fair you don't really want to discuss the Fab Four or whatever they're called or, or where, where that squad or whatever. Being in New York, that's the probably fab, tough. Wait, the Fab Four or the Fab Five? They were they. <laughs> you talking Chris about Weber? Oh, the can, Michigan Chris Weber? Can, can you name them all? No, I can't. Chris Re- Weber, I... Jalen Rose, uh, uh, Jawan Howard, yeah. Ray Jackson, and Jimmy King. Boom! Oh. Drop the mic. Oh, that is that is good. <laughs> I was thinking Jimmy Jackson, but of course that's... that's yeah. It's Ray Jackson and Jimmy King. And of course, Jawan Howard yeah. was the son of the greatest player ever to play at Providence College, Jimmy Walker. Right. right. And we all knew that because there you go. It's Providence College, which we follow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that's where you went. No, no, I, that's where I grew up. Oh, okay. All right. Well, look, you've been great. I, I think you're still, are you still in New York, the New York area? Things coming back to life? I you're am. okay? Family safe? Yeah, New York is, New York is hopping. Really? My wife is at the Botanical Garden today in the Bronx without a mask. Wow. Nice. Wow. Yeah. I gave up my apartment there uh, a year and a half ago. 
and and when I went back to pick up my stuff in in midsummer 2020, it was like you could see tumbleweed like <laughs> yeah. rolling down Times Square. Nobody was there, but it's back. Okay, it's back. All right, it's back. Well, look, I'm glad you're safe. Any closing parting words that you want to leave us with? Any tidbits of information that you want to give us? I've, 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 I've divulged too much. You really? You, now you said too much, and Bethany's going to have to kill nah, you? Yeah, nah. yeah. yeah, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> All Bethany, right. When Bethany listens to this, when Bethany listens to this, she's going to say, what is wrong with you? <laughs> How is that different than any other day you guys are working together? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our podcast. Joe was very generous with his time. I had a good time. Do you want us to follow you somewhere on Twitter? I mean, you know, I mean, if people want to, there's a lot of fun stuff to get sure. you in your feed once in a while. Sure. Opinion underscore Joe. Opinion underscore Joe. And if you want to follow us on Twitter, we're at Wolfpack Reports. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for having me. It was a blast. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, leave us a comment. Give us a retweet. Follow us on Twitter. Thanks for joining us.